Welcome everyone to our program today, how disinformation undermines fair elections and what can be done with Professor Rick Hassan, who is a professor of law and political science at the University of California in Irvine and the co-director of the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center. My name is Laurel Plimier, and I am the president of the League of Women Voters of Piedmont in California. And as always, I want to thank you all for taking some time out of your day to spend with us here on Zoom and on YouTube. This event is part of a larger Defending Democracy speaker series, and we're fortunate to have a number of local leagues from across the country who are sponsoring, co-sponsoring our series with us. Um, Collier, Collier County, Florida, Gunnison Valley, Colorado, Oakland, California, the Pikes Peak region in Colorado, Portland, Oregon, Pueblo, Colorado, Santa Barbara, California, and Solano County, California. We really appreciate your support, support and welcome uh, to all of the members and guests from those leagues who are here with us today. Um, we have, based on our registrations, we have 31 different local leagues from eight different states who are registered for oh. this event. So it's very exciting. Um, you may have seen our um, first four events on voting rights, ranked choice voting, election law in the Supreme Court, and then an international perspective last week. Um, if not, you can find all of those events on our YouTube channel, and there are also links to them on our website, which is lwvpmont.org. Um, before we get to the introduction of today's guest, I wanted to go over a few logistics quickly. Um, I expect that most of you are familiar with the Zoom webinar features. If you are on the Zoom call with us, please post your questions now or at any time um, during the presentation using the Q&A feature. You can use chat to introduce yourselves and, and shout out where you're coming from. Uh, but please put your questions in the Q&A. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can also um, post your questions in the live chat there on YouTube. And um, we will get through as many of the questions as we can at the in the last half of the program. If you are joining us on YouTube or watching the recording of, of, of the event there, please consider subscribing to our channel and clicking on the bell to get notifications of our future live stream events. And if you want advance notice of future events, please join our mailing list, which you can do on our website. Again, that's lwvpmont.org. And you can also become a member of the League there. The League is a nonpartisan organization. And what we mean when we say that is that we do not support or oppose any political candidate or political party. But we are political, and when you join the League, your dues alone support our grassroots efforts, both locally and at the state and national levels to empower voters and defend democracy. Um, if you visit our series event pages on our website, you'll see all of the logos of the other co-sponsor leagues. And um, if you click on a league that's in your area, you'll be taken to, to their website and you'll be able to join that local league directly. And you can also find your local league going to by going to lwv.org. And I will post um, a link for that. Somebody else may do this for me, but I, I will post a link in the chat so you can easily find your local league to join to join a league that's in your area. The league's efforts in voter education and advocacy are extremely important work and we greatly appreciate your support. And I am now going to hand things over to Gail Kong who served for 18 years as the founding president of the Asian Pacific Fund, which is a community foundation serving the San Francisco Bay Area. And that is dedicated to increasing philanthropy among Asians. And she is also currently on the board of the League of Women Voters of Oakland. Gail. Thank you, Laurel. Um, the League of Women Voters of Oakland is actually very pleased to be a co-sponsor of this terrific speaker series um, that was created the brainchild of Piedmont, our neighbor. Um, and I'm pleased to provide this background information about our speaker today. Richard Hassan is a professor of law and political science at the University of California, Irvine. And as you heard earlier, co-director of the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center. 
Professor Hassan is a nationally recognized expert in election law and campaign finance regulation. He has written about legislation and statutory interpretation, remedies and torts, and is co-author of leading case books in election law and remedies. From 2001 to 2010, he served as a founding co-editor of the quarterly peer-reviewed publication, Election Law Journal. He is the author of over 100 articles on election law issues, published in numerous journals, including the Harvard Law Review, Stanford Law Review, and Supreme Court Review. Professor Hassan was named one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America by the National Law Journal in 2013. His most recent book, Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons Our Politics and How to Cure It, lays out both legal and social measures to combat disinformation and protect democracy. Welcome, Professor Hassan. Thank you, and thanks um, to all of you for coming today. And I really have long appreciated the League's commitment to fair uh, elections and inclusive elections uh, throughout the country. And a, a good friend of mine, uh, Adam Ambrogi, has just become one of um, the executives over at the League in Washington, DC. And I'd worked with him when he was at the Democracy Fund. And so I feel like you've made a great hire. And so very excited uh, to be able to continue to work with all of you and, and work with him. Uh, so let, let me share some slides here. Y'all seeing that, I hope? Great. So uh, the, the topic today, and I plan to speak for about 20 minutes, um, uh, relates to a, a book of mine that came out last month called Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons Our Politics and How to Cure It. And let me just start off by defining what I mean by cheap speech. Um, so the term is not mine. The term actually comes from a professor at UCLA named Eugene Volokh. Uh, who wrote an article for the Yale Law Journal in 1995, where he was talking about changes in technology and how they were gonna change how we get information. And uh, in particular, uh, he was uh, concerned with um, what it was gonna be like when we would move from just a small number of TV and radio stations and a few local newspapers and a few national newspapers to uh, a flood of information. So we go from scarcity to, to uh, just so much information available to us. And he foresaw many things like the rise of services like Spotify and Netflix. And one of the things he also saw was that in this new cheap speech era, we would be also facing um, a, a decline in the power of intermediaries like newspapers. And he thought pretty optimistically that we would end up doing just fine with the decline of newspapers um, uh, because voters would still be able to find the truth. And so by cheap speech, he meant something that was positive. It was inexpensive to create and share and disseminate information. I mean cheap speech in a second, much more negative uh, uh, term as well. Uh, everything that Professor Volokh talked about in terms of the benefits of cheap speech are true. Uh, but what also happened uh, in, in this time period is that our cheap, uh, our speech has become cheap in terms of a system where lower valued speech has an advantage over higher valued speech. And let me explain what I mean by that. So back in the old days, it used to be very expensive for local journalists to produce investigative reporting on what local politicians were doing and how they were doing it. That's information that voters use to be able to uh, make decisions about which candidates they should support or oppose, which candidates are corrupt and all of that. Those costs are still the same. It's still very expensive to do this kind of investigative reporting. Um, and this is investigative reporting that, that helps voters. But at the same time that um, the costs have not gone down for producing this kind of information, the economic model that supports local newspapers has collapsed. Journalists have lost jobs faster than coal miners. And so um, what, what's happened is that the, the economic model for newspapers depended on classified advertising and other kinds of advertising. And all of that advertising moved from newspapers to first to Craigslist and, and, and Facebook Marketplace and now online. 
to the point where Google and Facebook collect a lot of the av advertising revenues that newspapers used to collect. And it's still expensive to produce newspapers, but at the same time, it's now become very inexpensive to produce misinformation and disinformation. That doesn't require lots of investments in um, investigations or anything like that. With new technology, you can create a website that looks about as good as a genuine newspaper's website, but is filled with misinformation and disinformation. And this is the world that we live in, a world in which lower valued information can be treated the same as higher valued information and in which voters can uh, have a harder time telling the difference between what's true and what's not true. And so in the book, I, I make a, a pretty stark claim at the beginning, uh, which is that if we uh, have the technology of the 1950s, but the politics of today, we would have much less likely had the insurrection that we had on January 6th. Donald Trump was able to undermine people's um, confidence in the fairness and integrity of the election process based on lies. There's no question that the 2020 election was administered fairly. There's no reason to believe that the election results announced by election officials for president anywhere in the country were substantially off, that they were marred by fraud. And yet Donald Trump went to Twitter over 400 times in the three weeks after election day to claim the election was stolen or rigged. He also, as you see in the tweet to the left, invited people to come to Washington, D.C. for what he called wild protests and of course held the Stop the Steal rally, which people were able to organize to come to through Facebook groups. And some of those people organized for violent action. It would have been much harder for Trump to get this message out. He certainly wouldn't have had the local news media or the newspaper repeat his false claims 400 times. He had direct access without intermediaries. And the result is that millions of people today now believe the false claim that the 2020 election was stolen. And that has all kinds of negative implications for our democracy going forward. When you don't have people believing that the last election was fair, they might do things to mess with the next election as a, as a kind of tit for tat. And so uh, one of the main problems that we've seen in the cheap speech era is that um, confidence in elections are being undermined by people who have political and or financial reasons to do so. But that's not the only problem that comes in the cheap speech era for voters. And let me show you a quick video that illustrates uh, another set of these problems. By feeding a complicated computer program millions of images and sound bites, it can learn to do this. President Trump is a total and complete dip. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. It's called a deep fake. We have the facts. Crafting realistic humanoids in video games or CGI movies used to take years of training, hundreds of people, and millions of dollars. But that's just not the case anymore. Today, with just a little facial mapping and powerful artificial intelligence, these sophisticated machine learning techniques are becoming accessible to people who don't necessarily have massive movie making budgets. Usually deepfakes are created to make unique videos, like making Nicolas Cage play Lois Lane in Superman or putting Steve Buscemi's face on Jennifer Lawrence's body during a Golden Globe speech. I, I just like, it was just, I, this, was, this was very truly surprising for me. But as the technology advances and becomes more believable, worries abound. By feeding a complicated- And so the rise of deep fakes is going to make it even easier uh, for those who want to spread disinformation to do so. And it's not even necessarily true that the disinformation will be believed, although you can imagine a video coming right before an election showing a candidate saying uh, some kind of racial epithet or in a sexually compromised position or uh, having a heart attack, right? All of these things could be faked. What it might do is cause people to just not believe anything. And in fact, this creates what uh, professors Chesney and Citroen have called the liar's dividend. People know that there's so much false information out there that when something true and embarrassing is revealed, they can just deny that it's actually true. And we saw this just a few weeks ago with Roger Stone, Roger Stone, uh, the Trump and Nixon fixer, who was um, caught on videotape as part of a documentary doing things related to the January 6th insurrection. The video, uh, some clips from the video documentary were released by the Washington Post and 
uh, Roger Stone's response to that was, well, those were deep fakes. That wasn't real. And in a world where there's lots of fake information, uh, those kind of claims can be plausible. Again, making it harder for voters to be able to tell, uh, make important um, distinctions between what's true and what's false as they make their voting decisions consistent with their values and their interests. And so in cheap speech, I go through and you see on the screen a list of the kinds of problems that uh, have arisen. Uh, problems with voter confidence, problems with lack of office holder accountability, eased foreign interference with elections, um, increased acceptance, acceptance of conspiracy theories and uh, the greater potential for election related violence, rising anonymous campaign activity, which makes it harder for voters to be able to tell truth from fiction. The rise of demagoguery, think of someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene. In the past, if she had extreme ideas, she'd have a very hard time fundraising. She would depend upon party leaders to fundraise for her. And if she had extreme ideas, the parties wouldn't do it because they wouldn't want to alienate uh, their voters. But today, someone like uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene can go right to voters and make an incendiary statement. And the more incendiary it is, the more likely it is to get a lot of coverage. And she can ask voters for $5. And it's much cheaper to ask voters for money today on social media than it was when you had to send out direct mail uh, or do radio advertising or, or, or advertising in newspapers. And so there are just many threats that come from the rise of cheap speech, threats which make uh, our democracy uh, harder to run and uh, really threaten the integrity of the electoral process. Um, so this is, an, this is especially a problem when it comes to uh, the risk of disinformation related to whether elections are fairly conducted. And so here's a poll from March of 2021, and you see that only 26% of Republicans believe that Joe Biden fairly won the 2020 election. And so what does that mean for a Biden presidency when there's a significant chunk of the population that believes his res the result is illegitimate? And it does, I think, threaten democracy as well as what happens when those people who um, believe this are going, some of them are going to be running elections in 2024. Are they going to be tempted to try to manipulate election results in order to even the score from what they see? So I think we really have a dangerous situation. And so the rest of my book, Cheap Speech, does two things. One, it talks about legal changes that could be made. And then it finally talks about non-legal changes, changes in society that can help to deal with the problem. And so in the book, I give a catalog of the kinds of changes that I would like to see. Changes which I believe would be consistent with the First Amendment and our uh, interest in balancing you know, the right to free and fair elections with the robust political speech that we need in a democracy. And so you can see on this slide here, I have a list of uh, the various uh, things that uh, I think should be done. Uh, many of them involve improved disclosure of information. So I don't want to go back to the era when we have only three uh, TV stations and just a few newspapers. It's great that we have the availability to get access to more information and be able to share our thoughts with whoever is willing to see or, or hear them. But what can we do to help voters separate truth from fiction? So a lot of these um, suggestions are, are along the lines of greater disclosure. So today, if there's an ad that says uh, Joe Biden is a true leader and you run that just before the election on TV and that ad comes to you on TV through your cable box or through your satellite provider like DirecTV, then there are certain disclosure rules that apply to that ad. But if that advertisement comes to you through YouTube TV or Hulu or Facebook, it's coming to you through an internet connection, then that advertisement is not subject to disclosure rules. I mean, that's a silly system. Another kind of disclosure related law that I support would be labeling deep fakes, those videos like I just showed you, as altered. Uh, this would help voters to be able to know, is this something I can trust or is this something I can't trust? And so I, I have a long list of things that I would like to see. I'll mention one more, which is, I think that it would be constitutional and a good idea to ban uh, statements that lie about when, where, and how people vote. So saying Democrats vote on Tuesday, Republicans vote on Wednesday, or to take a real world example from the 2016 election, a Trump supporter aimed messages at African-American voters telling them that they could vote by text or social media hashtag. 
The Supreme Court in 2018 suggested that laws that regulate misinformation and how people vote are indeed constitutional and they don't require a lot of discretion. We can just go to the uh, official materials of an election administrator to know is voting on Tuesday, can you vote by text? So it wouldn't solve all of the problems, but it would be an important marker to know that there are certain things uh, that would violate the law about saying things about how elections are actually run. What I don't support are laws that would require social media platforms to be even handed in how they uh, regulate content. Just like Fox News or the New York Times can decide what content to include or exclude. I think when Facebook and Twitter made a kind of late decision after January 6th, 2021 to deplatform Donald Trump, that this was a decision that was within the, the, the ability of private companies like Facebook and Twitter to make those decisions. Um, now, uh, I propose this list of changes, but it turns out that one big impediment to making uh, some of these changes is the Supreme Court's understanding of the First Amendment. And this isn't the talk to a group of lawyers, so I'll just briefly state here, and I can, again, respond to more of this in the Q&A, that there are, there are reasons to believe that some of these laws, like enhanced disclosure laws, would violate the First Amendment as the Supreme Court currently sees it. And that's because the Supreme Court's um, First Amendment cases are based on what I consider to be an outmoded view of the marketplace of ideas. The idea that, well, the solution to false speech is just more speech and you really can't have regulation of speech because, uh, especially political speech, because when you do that, um, uh, you're interfering too much with the political process and the truth will rise to the top regardless. Well, I think we can look at people's views about whether the 2020 election was fairly administered to know that uh, the truth has not risen to the top, at least among a number of voters. And so things like improved disclosure laws, which would actually provide voters with tools to be able to know what's true from what's false, um, some of those might be found unconstitutional under the First Amendment. And, and that's too bad because I think that's a misunderstanding of how the First Amendment should be interpreted. I also think it's interesting that a justice like Justice Thomas, very conserved justice on the Supreme Court, who believes you can't have any limits on campaign spending in elections, and who also believes that many disclosure laws are unconstitutional. Justice Thomas has expressed the view that states, as has happened in Florida and Texas, could in fact pass laws that would make it um, illegal to exclude a candidate like Donald Trump from a Facebook platform. And I think that especially a candidate who continuously undermines the integrity of the election process for no good reason, uh, or that advocates or, or invites political violence is someone that the platform should be able to exclude. And that it violates the First Amendment to tell Facebook, you've got to include Donald Trump, just like it would violate the First Amendment to tell Fox News or MSNBC which candidates they have to include or exclude. All right, in the interest of time, let me just turn to um, the kinds of changes that I would like to see beyond law, in part because legal change won't be enough even if it's enacted, and in part because many of the laws I suggest either won't be enacted because we have such gridlock in Washington, or because some of these laws, if enacted, might violate the First Amendment. Uh, so the kinds of things I'm talking about are uh, things like um, pressuring the platforms to make changes to serious democracy problems caused by cheap speech, including deplatforming in extreme circumstances. I think that generally speaking, there should be a huge thumb on the scale in favor of um, including the speech of politicians. Again, this is, I'm not talking about a government law, I'm talking about what private companies like Facebook decide to do. But I think that Donald Trump clearly crossed the line by continuously undermining the integrity of the election process for no good reason, and by inviting his supporters to Washington for a wild time and then not condemning the violence. I think that in that circumstance, the platforms were right to exclude Donald Trump and they should continue to do so. Although there's going to be a lot of pressure to put him back on the platforms, especially if he decides to run for president again. Um, I also think we should subsidize, uh, encourage private um, uh, donors to subsidize journalism, uh, especially investigative journalism on the local level. And I point to some models like the Texas Tribune or the Nevada Independent as good examples of 
quality investigative journalist, journalistic outfits. I also think that we can do things to help send signals to voters about reliable intermediaries, like uh, journalistic societies could say, here's a set of criteria for what we count to be legitimate journalism. For example, you need to have two sources before you make a claim, or you need to give the candidates a chance to respond in the event that they uh, are spoken about uh, in an article. I, I think we can do all of these things and we could do so in a way that would um, allow for these journalistic sites to create seals of approval. And then the social media companies can piggyback on that. So if you see, for example, a tweet from the Los Angeles Times, you know that that is a reputable news organization. That, that little symbol could appear right next to the name Los Angeles Times. And this would give voters another tool uh, to know whether or not uh, something is true or not. And the general idea is we wanna rebuild the reliable intermediaries so that voters are able to tell what is reliable information and what is not. And more generally, and I'll end on this point, we need a kind of social education process, not just for young people, but especially for older people as well, who are much more likely to spread disinformation online. Uh, uh, information about digital literacy and how to tell truth from uh, falsity, as well as inculcating values of respect for the scientific process and for truth and for um, respect for the rule of law, which is something uh, that we've taken for granted for a long time in this country. But I think we no longer can take for granted that people will accept the idea that we're going to have free and fair elections. We're going to accept the results, even if we don't like them. And then we're going to, if we don't like them, we're going to organize to try to win the next election in a free and fair election. And with that, let me turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hassan, um, for your presentation. We have a bunch of questions. I wanted to um, mention at the top here that we have a quarterly book club and our book club pick for our next meeting, which is on April 19th, is your book Cheap Speech. So if anyone here is interested in joining us, um, in a deeper conversation on some of the to topics we're talking about today. You can find that information um, on our website. I meant to mention that at the, at the top of the hour. Um, so I wanted to start by asking some questions about the um, laws surrounding election speech. Um, you talked about um, making a, a law that might specifically prohibit uh, incorrect speech about how and and why to um, how and where you know election mechanics. Um, we in the league spend a lot of our time disseminating information to the public about how and where to vote. How would that law perhaps pose problems for an organization like the league, um, or would there be um, an exception to the law for any uh, innocent errors that that volunteers in an organization like ours might make? That's a great question. And so let me back up for a minute and talk about another proposal I make, which has to do with defamation law, and then I can answer your question. So uh, if someone makes a false statement um, about someone else and damages their reputation, then they can be sued for uh, defamation. And um, uh, for example, there are now lawsuits against Fox News, uh, One American News Network, and Newsmax brought by some voting machine companies who make the claim that uh, those um, uh, TV networks gave false information claiming that these machines were somehow rigged or manipulated to deprive Donald Trump of uh, his, his victory. Since the 1964 uh, decision in New York Times versus Sullivan, if you make a statement um, in a newspaper or elsewhere about a public uh, official, or as the Supreme Court later extended it to a public figure, you cannot be held liable in tort law for defamation unless that statement is made with actual malice. Actual malice means the statement was made knowing that it was false or with reckless disregard as to whether it was true or false. You may have heard of the uh, recent lawsuit that Sarah Palin brought against the New York Times in which the New York Times editorial included a false statement about Sarah Palin's, something that Sarah Palin uh, supposedly had said. Um, and um, 
the New York Times won that lawsuit, not because the statement was true, it wasn't true, but because of the actual malice standard, because Sarah Palin couldn't prove to either a jury or to the judge that um, the uh, uh, statement was made knowing it was false or with reckless disregard to its truth or falsity. There have been some proposals to get rid of the actual malice requirement. Donald Trump famously said he wanted to loosen up the libel laws. And two justices on the Supreme Court, Justices Thomas and Gorsuch, have suggested that they might go along with that, that the First Amendment doesn't require the actual malice standard, which make it easier to sue for defamation. Justice Gorsuch, in an opinion he wrote, specifically tied this to the risk of disinformation and said, if you're worried about lies, make it easier to sue people for lies. I actually think this is the wrong way to deal with disinformation because we need to give breathing room for people to make innocent mistakes, especially when they're talking about public officials who need to be held accountable. And so roundabout answer to your question, uh, any law that would make it a crime to lie about when, where, how people vote would require proof of actual malice. And so if someone made an innocent mistake, so let's say that there are five ways that you can, in a state, uh, five different forms of identification that are accepted for voting. And someone from the league makes a mistake and includes a sixth way, you know, includes a utility bill, but that turns out to be a mistake. And it's an honest mistake. Um, then there would be no liability under the law because you wouldn't be able to show that it was a knowing mistake. Um, and that, you know, did you do anything to try to assure that it was true? Now you might say, that still might be a deterrent. You're gonna to have to be extra careful before you post such information. And I'd say, yeah, that's exactly the point. You, got, you want people to be more careful because you don't want people to even inadvertently be sharing misinformation about how to vote. And so if there's really only five kinds of IDs that are acceptable for voting in a state, you wanna make sure that people are sharing accurate information. But I do think the law should be written so it'd be clear that somebody who's acting in good faith would not be liable under such a law. That's good news for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about micro-targeting? You, you talk about it in your book. I don't think you really covered it in your slides, but I thought it was um, interesting. Um, you talked about micro-targeting and the effect that social media has um, where they can very, very specifically target an audience and how that is really negative. And I'm curious about the difference between what social media does with, tar with micro-targeting -tar and what like, you know, if, if I were campaigning before the age of social media and I might publish a flyer and only distribute in a certain neighborhood, I'm micro-targeting that neighborhood. Can you speak a little bit about the differences there and what the issues with micro-targeting are? Yeah, it's a little complicated, both on the facts and the law, which is why I didn't cover it in my initial presentation, but, but happy Sorry. to <laughs> No, I'm happy to answer a question about it uh, if there's interest in that. So um, you're right that targeting ads to specific populations uh, is nothing new. You know, my wife would sometimes get campaign flyers uh, that would highlight, say, abortion issues that I wouldn't get. It's pretty clear that it campaigns will say, all right, find all the women on the list and send them this, or look for people with Hispanic surnames, or target people in this zip code rather than all the places where I'm running for office. That's nothing new. And I wouldn't make um, uh, any uh, uh, limitation on the ability to do that. But something different happens with social media. So Let's say that I am running for Senate in California and um, I, I've got a message that I want to target to uh, blue collar white men over the age of 50. And I've, uh, as a campaign, I've collected data on some of my people. And so I say to Facebook, here's a list of 100 people that I want to target and add to. Facebook has something called a lookalike feature. And what they will do for a fee is they will look at, they'll find in their database, you know, the hundred people or however many they have, they'll match their email address or something to figure out who they are. They'll use that as a basis for 
finding other people who did not opt into getting the campaign's emails or, or anything like that, um, but who have similar demographics. And the way they're doing that is they're relying upon data that the companies have collected from us through our use of social media. So when we opt in to Twitter's use of service or Facebook or Instagram or whatever, Pinterest, whatever platform, we agree that they can track us online and they know like, oh, this is someone who shops at Whole Foods or, you know, this is someone, uh, you know, who uh, has attended a Trump rally. Uh, some of them will use, you know, geocoding. So they'll know where you are and what you're doing and all of that. And so Facebook uh, will use the data it's collected and for a fee, charge the campaigns to, to target ads at these people. It's the difference between using a photograph of a person to figure out what message you might target to them and using a machine that can read their minds because the companies have collected so much more data about us than anyone in history has ever been able to collect about a stranger before. And so what I argue is that you could have a law that would ban um, not campaigns, but social media companies from using the data they've collected to help micro-target ads. So Facebook can still distribute the ads to the 100 people on your list, but they couldn't use the lookalike feature, if that makes sense. And the rationale for this is that we know that information that is micro-targeted will often be misleading or worse, that will often be targeted at vulnerable populations, and that it can you know, lead people to make decisions that might not be consistent with their preferences, especially if, if the messages contain misinformation. And so that's the limit that, you know, in that very limited context, I would not allow campaigns to be able to hire these social media companies to use their data to do this. Now, of all of the proposals that I su suggest in chapter three of the book, this is the one that I think has probably the least chance of being upheld as constitutional. And one of the first problems with the, that the court would likely have with my proposal, even apart from the question of whether there's a First Amendment right to collect data and use the data for political messages, which is a difficult question. This law is what lawyers call a content-based restriction on speech. I'm saying you can't micro-target an ad for political purposes but you can micro-target an ad if you wanna sell someone a sofa or something else. And the Supreme Court has said in a number of cases that content-based restrictions on speech, political speech is subject to one rule, non-political speech is subject to another rule, that that, is, uh, that law is subject to strict scrutiny, meaning it's likely to be struck down. And so, well, we could change the law that I'm proposing and say, all right, let's just prevent um, Facebook from targeting, using its data to target ads to anyone. Well, that would solve the problem that I talked about because you're no longer singling out political speech. But not only would that still raise the question about whether data um, uh, is itself protected by the First Amendment and the use of data for messages is protected by the First Amendment, it would also completely undermine the business model of these companies. A big way that these companies are profitable is they can say to advertisers, we can do this more cheaply by targeting ads at people who are likely to buy your sofa or are likely to support you for office. And so it would be kind of an existential battle for the platforms. They're not going to want a law like this. And so I think it's, you know, it'd be, it, it's very hard to figure out a way to deal with this question that would be both politically doable as well as constitutional as the Supreme Court understands the First Amendment. Do you think there's any way that the um, Supreme Court would consider making a distinction between political speech and other speech because of the importance of maintaining free and fair elections in our country and supporting democracy? Right. So it's possible that the court would do that. But the court also has expressed a lot of concern about um, laws that are well-intentioned. Uh, but that go to the core of political speech. Um, and because the danger is you're going to stifle robust debate in elections. That's why, and this is one of the reasons I helped to co-found the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center, this calls for a, um, 
a trade-off, right? So if we had someone we could trust, maybe we could have a speech czar that could say, this speech is bad, this speech is good, now let's have a fair election. But just imagine whoever is the president uh, that you think is the least trustworthy, whoever or she or he is, and imagine that this president gets to appoint the speech czar. Uh, you can imagine all kinds of manipulation. So you say, we're going to give the speech czar uh, the ability to, um, to um, require social media companies to delete all misleading election information. And you put that in the hands of a bad actor and it would look very bad. And so I think that following the Trump era, I think the kind of government-based solutions to speech issues that might've been appealing to some people on the left, especially, look a lot less appealing when you see what the abuse might look like. And, and I think that you know those on the right would be very fearful of a Biden administration that would have the power to say, you know, Donald Trump is saying the election is rigged, that's dangerous, let's remove that speech as a government matter. Now, I advocate removing that speech as a matter for private companies to do, and I urge those private companies to do the right thing. And I hope that employees of the companies and consumers of the companies are gonna pressure the companies to do the right thing. And if these companies are so powerful that they can't be pressured, then I think the solution is not a speech code for these companies, but use antitrust to break the companies up. So Meta owns Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp. Maybe it shouldn't own all of them. Google is very powerful in search. Let me give you another example. During the 2020 election, there was a time on Instagram where if you did a search for Joe Biden, not only would you get Joe Biden related content, you'd also get positive content about Donald Trump. But if you did a search for Donald Trump, you would not get any positive content about Joe Biden. And um, Meta explained that this was a glitch. That wasn't how the system was supposed to work and they fixed it. There was a report in BuzzFeed and once it was reported, it was fixed. But there's nothing in the law that requires a social media company to be even-handed. And so think about Google search. Imagine that Google really likes one candidate for president and really dislikes the other. And so they decide, you know, you search for candidate A, you're gonna get all kinds of positive information about candidate A and negative about B. And if you search for B, you're gonna get the same thing, right? You can imagine that uh, a, a social media company or a, in this case, a search company could try to manipulate things. Again, they're private companies. If we think they're too powerful, maybe we need to break up search so that uh, antitrust breaks it up. But I don't think we can say you can't do that. What I uh, advocate in the book, it's another one of my law side suggestions, is that if, if there's credible information that companies are manipulating search results to help one candidate or another, they either have to sign a statement saying that's what they're doing and that gets publicly released, you know, Google, Google endorses and promotes candidate A over candidate B, or if the uh, company won't sign that, that there'll be some way to have election, uh, 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 computer experts um, uh, look at the code, look at the algorithm to see if there is manipulation being done. It wouldn't, the code wouldn't be publicly released because that could raise all kinds of problems of trade secrets, but you'd allow some uh, government uh, body to be able to look, and then they can declare that the algorithm is in fact being tweaked to help one candidate or another, or it's not. Um, so I think that, you know, th those are the kinds of solutions rather than having a government bureaucrat who could be under the control of a very partisan president from what, again, from whatever party you don't like, being able to make these decisions as a matter of, of law. That raises some very serious First Amendment concerns. And even if we didn't have the First Amendment, it would just be very bad policy to have that. You talked about deep fakes and, and showed the video, which looking at that video, it seems pretty clear that something's been going on, but I can imagine that the technology for deep fakes is going to get better and better. And I'm curious if you have information about, um, you, you know, how, how could you re regulate deep fakes if there's no way to identify that something is or isn't a deep fake? Yes, I address this in a, in a long footnote in, in the Cheap Speech book uh, and basically say, it's a kind of cat and mouse game uh, because the technology keeps changing and the ways of detecting the technology keep changing. There are people, 
computer scientists who are working, you know, this is their primary project, is to try to create technology that can allow you to look at a video and determine whether or not it is manipulated. And what I say is that the companies could be required to use what I call the best available technology in order to determine whether something is an altered audio or video. And it will always be a, just like with campaign finance laws where you pass a law and then someone finds a loophole and then you have to pass another law to deal with the loophole. Same kind of thing here. It might not be a perfect system, but you catch a lot of it. And I would require that when it's found, there has to be a, a means of labeling the video as altered. Now, California has kind of a similar law on deep fakes. It only lasts till 2023, but it creates an exemption for satire. And to me, that's really an unworkable system. Again, do you think a government bureaucrat can decide whether something is serious or it's satire? I worry about that in the hands of someone, a government official I don't trust. That's why I say, label all the video as altered, even if it's satire, okay. So when you're watching the satire, is it a little less enjoyable that it has the word altered in the corner? I don't think it really affects the message. But, you know, I'm trying to look for ways, and this is kind of a general theme of the book, look for ways to give voters better information to be able to make choices consistent with their interests and values in a way that doesn't interfere with the message itself, but gives voters tools to know how reliable is the message, how credible is the message, who is speaking. So let me give it a, a, an, an example in terms of who's speaking. Uh, we, talk, we talked a little bit about Russian disinformation. I see someone mentioned that in the chat. Uh, let me give a different example. This is one involving uh, Democrats uh, engaged in a disinformation effort. You may remember that in 2017, uh, there was a special election in Alabama. Uh, Jeff Sessions was the, one of the US senators from Alabama. He became the attorney general under Donald Trump, and there had to be a special election to fill his seat. Eventually, it was Doug Jones, the Democratic candidate, against Roy Moore, who was the Republican candidate. Roy Moore was a very controversial figure. There were claims that he was had dated teenagers. Uh, he was the Ten Commandments judge who uh, had been punished uh, and, and removed from office. And so he ran for office uh, more against Jones. And there were people supporting Jones. Very hard for a Democrat to win in Alabama. It's a solidly red state. Jones actually won that race because Moore was such a controversial figure. And one of the things that happened during the campaign was that um, activists on the left who supported Doug Jones, without Jones's knowledge, Jones had nothing to do with this, but independent of Jones, um, there was a disinformation campaign aimed at moderate Republican voters. One thing that this group did was they sent messages on Twitter and elsewhere to make it look like Russian bots were following Roy Moore to make it seem like the Russians were supporting Roy Moore. Another thing they did was that they posed as very conservative Baptists who believed that uh, there should be no alcohol for sale in the state of Alabama and that they supported Roy Moore. The idea was turn off moderate Republicans. So they think that Roy Moore is gonna be an extremist. He's gonna ban alcohol and try and convince them not to not to come out and vote at all. Okay, so how do you deal with that? Uh, again, I don't think we can have a law that says that you can't lie and and uh, you know uh, claim to be somebody else. You know, people pose as other people. But what if we say if you spend any resources on trying to convince people as to how they should vote, uh, uh, significant enough resources? Let's say you spend ten thousand dollars or more. You have to disclose your identity. And so if you knew that they weren't Baptist teetotalers, but they were Democratic operatives that were running these ads, you might, and you're a conservative Republican in Alabama, you might evaluate that message differently. Just like if you're an African-American voter in 2016, getting messages saying, don't vote for Hillary Clinton, she doesn't believe that Black Lives Matter, you'd want to know that that message didn't come from the stock photo of the Black voter in your uh, town, but instead came from a Russian government uh, worker working in a boiler room in St. Petersburg, Russia. So, you know, giving voters more information is what I think would be helpful. There are um, 
many municipalities in California that are looking to move their elections so that they're only on even years so that they correlate with the um, national elections. Um, do you see uh, cheap speech having any effect on that and whether that um, might increase or decrease democracy, um, either because there's more uh, nationalized ballot, you know, more crowded ballot in the, during the national election year, or, you know, maybe it's better because more voters will get out and vote during those years than they would in an off year. So I think that that is a really difficult question. And one of the reasons I think uh, that that's a difficult question um, uh, is because on the one hand, low turnout elections are really bad uh, for democracy. You want as many people voting as possible so that the elections reflect the will of the people. On the other hand, when you hold elections, at, at, and so if you, if you move the election to the same time as say the president, um, then that, uh, you're going to get higher turnout, even if there's some roll offs So not everybody who votes for president will vote for the city council, but you'll get more turnout uh, because people have already gotten themselves to the polling place. On the other hand, um, there are lots of negative consequences of nationalizing elections. First, it's hard to get attention. So, you know, we think about the last president, last two presidential elections, they're kind of all consuming affairs. You know, it's it's Trump Biden or Trump Clinton all the time. If you're a candidate for, you know, Board of Supervisors in um, San Mateo County, who's going to pay attention to that race? And especially if that race is a nonpartisan race where there's no D or R next to your name. So voters don't have a good sense of how they should vote. Then maybe that race gets buried. And and this goes um, to the point you were just raising it does have a danger of nationalizing our elections. And so to the extent there are partisan, act, uh, partisan um, labels next to uh, candidates' names, you know, if you go in to vote for the Democratic candidate, you might vote Democrat all the way down the ballot or Republican all the way down the ballot. And you might not be focused on, you know, it could be that the, you know, San Mateo County supervisor is a Republican, but has very different views than the Republican nominee of, of you know, from of the president. And so it does risk uh, nationalizing things and making it more focused on national questions than on local questions. And when you think about our day to day lives, think about trash collection, the problem of homelessness, um, the kinds of things that affect us every day. There's so much more power on the local level uh, than there is on the national level to deal with a lot of these problems and nationalizing our elections is somewhat problematic. So I think it's a really hard question. I think the cheap speech book is very tangential to that question, but I think it is a difficult question. It's hard to know how to balance those things. You, you mentioned a little bit the, the Russian Bots. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about the balance between privacy um, and uh, wanting to regulate disinformation. And if we did something like require that any social media account has an actual human being who you can identify by name and location behind it, is that something that is um, not so good because it goes against privacy laws? And is that balanced out by the need to have accurate information? So let's talk for a minute about campaign finance disclosure, and I'll come back to that. The Supreme Court since 1976, in a famous case called Buckley versus Vallejo, has said that you can have uh, laws that require people who spend money in elections or contribute to campaigns to have their identities disclosed, that there's no general right to anonymity there. Uh, and the court recognized three reasons. Uh, allowing disclosure prevents corruption and the appearance of corruption, because you could look for corrupt deals between donors and candidates. It provides voters with valuable information. Think about if I tell you that there's a California ballot proposition that is supported by Planned Parenthood and opposed by the National Rifle Association, I'm guessing lots of people who are watching today will know how to vote, even if I don't tell you the content of that. And disclosure helps to enforce other campaign finance laws, like laws banning foreign money in elections. Even though the Supreme Court recognized that disclosure laws can serve these important interests, it also recognized that in some circumstances, disclosure can subject people to harassment. And it therefore said that as a constitutional matter, 
Disclosure laws have to have an exemption for people who face a realistic threat of harassment. And I think that's the right balance. If someone's spending thousands and thousands of dollars on elections, they shouldn't have a general right to anonymity. After all, it was conservative Justice Antonin Scalia who came out broadly in favor of political accountability that comes with disclosure. He said, you know, anonymous uh, campaigning is not honorable any more than an anonymous phone call is honorable. He said, this doesn't resemble the home of the brave. And yet if there is a problem of harassment, then there should be an exemption. And so I personally think we should raise the thresholds. If you give a hundred dollars, let's say, you know, you live in San Francisco, which is a very liberal city, and you give $100 to Donald Trump, and your neighbors can all look that up. I don't know that you're going to face harassment, but you should have a right, some right to privacy to be able to not have that information disclosed. But if you give $10,000 or $20,000, you're actually going to have more influence. You're not just an individual person uh, you know, doing nothing. Let's say someone's spending millions of dollars on a um, on a campaign to influence voters, then there should be disclosure unless there could be a demonstrated risk of harassment. And that's how I think those two things should be balanced. General view in favor of disclosure and exemption for when, when you can really show that it's going to chill speech. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court in a decision uh, that it issued last July called Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Bonta has signaled, didn't hold, but it's signaled that it's going to take a much more uh, exacting scrutiny, much closer level of review of disclosure laws in the future. And the Supreme Court seems to be signaling that you shouldn't have to show a risk of chilling, a risk that you're gonna be harassed. They're gonna assume that there's a big danger of harassment and they might start striking down disclosure laws. So right at the moment where I think disclosure laws are the most important as we you know, enter into this era where disinformation becomes rampant, we are in a period where we're going to see um, the Supreme Court likely cutting back on the constitutionality of disclosure laws. And I think that's exactly the wrong direction for them to go in. We have just a couple of minutes left, and I'd like to ask one final question of all of our um, speakers in this series, and that is, what is the most important concrete step that each of us can take to protect our democracy? Oh, well, what, just one? <laughs> uh, I would say uh, it'll have to be one with subparts. I would say vigilance. Um, we can't take our democracy for granted. We have to hold election officials accountable, um, make sure that they're running free and fair elections and are transparent. We have to hold ourselves accountable. We shouldn't be part of the problem in spreading disinformation. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is. And maybe you should think twice before hitting that share button. Uh, we don't wanna become part of the problem. Thank you. Um... I really appreciate all of the thoughtful questions that people had and the information that I've person personally learned. Um, I'm very grateful to our guest, uh, Professor Hassan, for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you so much. Um, feel free for those watching to share the YouTube link to the recording of this live stream. Um, and if you've registered for this event, we will be sending that to you um, via email. Um, and also consider subscribing to our YouTube channel for easy access to future events and becoming a member of your local League of Women Voters. This officially ends our program. Thank you so much for being with us.